Um, at this time, it's my honor to introduce our final speaker for the day, Mr. Jonah Berger. Jonah is a best-selling author and professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a world-renowned expert on change, influence, word of mouth, natural language processing, consumer behaviors, and how products, ideas, <clears throat> and behaviors catch on. He has published over 50 articles, sold over a million books, including The Catalyst, How to Change Anyone's Mind, which you all have received a signed copy of today. And Jonah is going to present to us today, Contagious, Why Things Catch On. Please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Jonah Berger. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so, so much. I uh, did an event recently where I kept my mask on for the first five minutes. It's like no one can hear me. So um, I'm going to keep it off for the beginning of this uh, one, but I am, I am vaccinated. And it's great to get a chance uh, to see you all uh, and talk to everybody. I think when we think about uh, innovation uh, and uh, rethinking innovation, we think about change. Uh, and to create change is, is really hard, right? Uh, all of us want to change uh, one thing or another. We want to change consumer behavior. Uh, we want to change a potential client's mind. Uh, we want to change our boss's mind. We want to take a college action. Uh, startups want to change industries. Nonprofits want to change the world. Uh, but change is really hard. Often we push, we pressure, we cajole, uh, and nothing happens. And so the question I'm going to ask very simply today is, uh, is there a better way? Is there a better way to create change uh, and drive action, not by pushing, but by doing something else? Uh, and so I'll talk about a few things today. We'll talk about rethinking innovation, uh, changing customer or consumers' minds, uh, and shifting perspectives within our organizations. Uh, and so as nicely mentioned, I'm Professor Jonah Berger. I'm a marketing professor. I'm going to point in a direction. I'm not sure which direction is south, but somewhere in that direction, uh, down at the Wharton School, uh, uh, a little bit south of us. Uh, what we do today uh, is talk about my recent uh, New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, uh, The Catalyst, How to Change uh, Anyone's Mind. My goal here is really simple. I know we only have about an hour together, but to give you a sense of appetizer for some of the uh, ideas in the book. Uh, my hope is that you walk out of here with two or three things that you can do tomorrow uh, to make change easier uh, and, uh, and more likely. Um, I will save time at the end for questions. I know for the thousands of us that are here in person, it's going to be difficult to get all the questions in, uh, but we will make sure to make time to do that. Um, uh, and if folks on the live stream have questions, I'm happy to try to answer those uh, as well. Um, but I want to start off today by talking uh, about uh, a villain. Uh, what do I mean a villain? Well, we're all on a journey. We're actually all on a hero's journey. We all have something that we want to change. Right? You may be trying to change innovation within your organization. You may be trying to change a customer or a client's mind. You may be trying to change consumer behavior. That's the goal you have. Uh, but there in every hero's journey is a villain. Uh, and the villain in this story uh, is something called the status quo bias. And then we have any idea what the status quo bias is? Anyone heard of the status quo bias before? I know there are thousands of us here in person. But you, if you have, you can raise your hand. We can call it. We have small enough numbers to call it. Yeah. Inertia. Inertia. What do you mean? Perfect, yes. Uh, Newton's, I don't remember which law it is, but one of, one of Newton's. Like, body motion stays in motion, body at rest uh, stays at rest. Anytime we have a choice, uh, we often are choosing between an incumbent and something new, right? Uh, an old product and a potentially new product we could buy. An old way of doing things and a potentially new way of doing things. Uh, uh, an existing uh, service provider or business that we work with and a new one that seems like it might be better. Whenever we're faced with such a choice, we have a bias to stick with, as nicely said, the status quo. Makes well, well thought out term, it, it means what it says. We tend to stick with what we're already doing. So let's take a really simple case, consumers uh, shopping. We tend to buy as consumers the same products and services we've bought before. When we go to the grocery store, for example, we tend to buy the same things again and again. Not the same things every week, but if you make a particular recipe, I bet you buy the same ingredients from the same companies. Why? Because it's just easier. It's easier to buy the same things you have before. If you've ever tried shopping when you're on vacation at like a new grocery store, even if you want to buy the same things at a new grocery store, much more difficult because you don't know where they are. Right? And even if you knew where they are, finding them is difficult. It requires more work. Right? And so that's one reason for the status quo bias. Old stuff is easier than new stuff. But there are some other reasons as well. Another one is attachment. There's a great study, for example, that looks at people selling homes. They find that the longer you've lived in a home, the more you value that home above market price. Why? Because it's no longer just a home. It's your home. And it becomes difficult to imagine giving that up. Right? Same thing is true often uh, when venture firms or um, uh, equity firms try to buy startups that are founder-owned. Uh, right? Founder-owned companies tend to value themselves above and beyond companies that are uh, not founder-owned. Family-owned businesses, same thing in spades. Right? Family-owned businesses tend to have a lot of value for their organization because they're attached to it. 
Same thing with ideas within organizations, right? If it's your idea, you think it's a better idea than if it's someone, someone else's. And so not only is, are older things easier and we're attached to them, but new things often feel uncertain, right? Sure, we, whether we are a marketer, a salesperson, a colleague, whoever we may be, say that this new thing will be better, but how does someone actually know? Right? Old things feel safe, new things feel risky. And so all of these aspects contribute to the status quo bias. And so one thing we're going to talk about today is, well, how do we overcome that bias? Right? Uh, if this villain is there, what do we do to overcome uh, this, this villain? And usually, when we think about uh, trying to overcome the status quo bias, we think of some version of what I'll call pushing. And so in writing this book, I've interviewed thousands of executives from all sorts of different industries. I've asked them to write down, what is something you want to change? And what is something you could do to try to change it? And over 98% of the time, people list some version of pushing. I'll make one more phone call, uh, send one more email, make one more presentation, list all the reasons why someone should do something, emotional or factual. Right? If I just push people a little harder, they'll come around. And it's clear why we think that works. Right? If there's a physical object, like a chair, in the middle of a room, and we want to move that chair, pushing it is a great way to get it to go. Right? We put some pressure on that side, it slides across the floor. And so we apply that same intuition to people. We think if we just push on that person a little harder, they will slide uh, across the floor. Uh, but think about when we apply that intuition to people, what happens. Right? Think about the last time someone pushed you. Did you just slide across the floor? What might you have done instead? Push back. Dig in your heels. Resist. Think about all the reasons why you don't want to do what was suggested. Right? And there's some very old research uh, in psychology on something called the tension system, which says basically exactly this. Right? There's forces going one way, but there are also forces going the other way. And sometimes the more we push, the more people create push force back, and they don't go anywhere. And so if pushing doesn't work, what does? Well, there's a nice analogy to be made to chemistry. Uh, and I'm not a chemist, but I do play basketball sometimes with some chemists. Uh, and so talk to them a lot uh, in, in writing this book. Um, and it turns out that changing chemistry is really hard. Right? So think about carbon, for example, over eons being squeezed into diamonds, uh, or plant matter being turned into oil. Right? And so in the lab, to speed up that process, chemists often add temperature and pressure. They squeeze things together. They heat them up to make change more, more likely. Uh, an easy way to think about it is if you think about a popcorn kernel, you throw it in the microwave, heats up on the inside, pops, and, and there's popcorn. And so chemists do the same thing in the lab. They add energy to create change. But it turns out there's a special set of substances they use that make change happen faster and easier with less energy, not more. These substances do everything from clean the grime on our contact lenses to clean the grime on our car's engine. Multiple Nobel Prizes have been won for innovations in the space. And as you can already guess, these substances are called catalysts. Right? And what's most interesting about how catalysts work, when you think about the social world, when you say someone's a catalyst, we mean they're a change agent. But in chemistry, catalyst has a really specific meaning. It's not just a change agent. It allows change to happen with less energy, not more. Right? Great catalysts in chemistry, they sort of figure out what the barriers are to change, and they mitigate them. And we can think about the same thing in the social world. Rather than saying, well, what could I do to get someone to change, great catalysts, great change agents take a subtly but importantly different approach. They ask, why hasn't that person changed already? What's stopping them? What are the barriers or obstacles that are in the way that are preventing change? And how, by getting rid of those barriers, can I make change more likely to happen? Right? If you think about it, imagine being parked in your car. Right? So you come out, uh, out of the mall or out of a game, and your, your car is parked on a hill. So you get in the car, you stick your key in the ignition, you turn it, and you step your foot on the gas. Right? If the car doesn't go, we think we just need more gas. If the person, the organization, the people we're trying to change don't change, we just think we need more gas, more pressure. Right? But you can step on the gas pedal all you want. If the parking brake on that car is pulled up, the car's not going to go anywhere. Right? And so the main idea of what I'm going to talk about today, so if you step out for 50 minutes, you come back, you wonder what you missed, is this simple but I think important idea. How can we all be better at finding the parking brakes? Whatever we're trying to change, identifying what those brakes are that are getting in the way and removing them. Right? And in writing this book, I talked to an amazing set of change agents. I talked to top-selling salespeople, uh, 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 folks uh, within organizations that change their bosses or colleagues' mind. I talked to startup founders. I talked to great consultants. I talked to marketers that got millions, a hundred million dollars in sales. But I also talked to some unusual change agents, uh, hostage negotiators, substance abuse counselors, parenting experts. I'm sure we all are interested in at least that set of the ideas. Um, and it turns out the barriers to change are the same. Right? I kept seeing the same five barriers come up again and again 
whether I was talking to someone who had a suggestion about how to get your kids to eat their vegetables, or a consultant who was talking about how to get clients to get on board with, with an initiative. And so in the Catalyst, I put them in a framework. It's called the REDUCE framework. That stands for reactance, endowment, distance, uncertainty, and corroborating evidence. These are the five barriers that come up again uh, and again. Put them together, they spell a word, which is reduce. I cheated a little bit with the C and E on the last one. You, know, you, can, you can talk to me about it later. Uh, but which is exactly what great catalysts do. They don't push harder. They don't provide more facts, more figures, more reasons. They identify the barriers to change, and they mitigate them. And I think, particularly as marketers, we think uh, a lot of the time the barrier is information. If people just had more information, they'd change. The barrier is rarely information. We think it's information, but it's often something else. Uh, and so what I'm going to do today is go through at least a couple of these barriers. I'll talk about reactance, uh, uh, because I think it happens everywhere. Uh, and I'll also talk about uncertainty, because I think it's really important as we think about uh, innovation um, uh, and how to make uh, that more likely. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, about the others. And obviously, there's a whole book uh, that you guys are getting. Uh, and so treat this as an appetizer to that book. But again, my hope is that you walk out of here today with two, three, maybe even four or five things you can do tomorrow to make whatever change you're looking for more likely. And what I would say is the more that you go through this presentation with a thing you want to change in mind, the more useful the strategies will be. So if you don't, that's fine. If you have multiple, as I imagine you do, that's also fine. Uh, but uh, hopefully you'll begin to see how the strategies will help you. So let me jump right in. Uh, and to do that, I want to talk about uh, these. Does anyone know what these are? Tide Pods. Go ahead. So let me tell you a little story about Tide Pods. So a decade ago, Tide, owned by Procter & Gamble, wants to make doing laundry faster and easier. It's not that difficult, but there are a few things that tend to get in the way, right? We never know how much detergent to add. Some of it gets spilled on the counter, our hands. We'd actually love to be able to put, turns out, to make your clothes better, some of it in early in the cycle and some later, but you can't do that with liquid detergent. And so Tide puts a bunch of money in research and development, and they come up with these little things, colorful pods called Tide Pods. Basically, set it and forget it. Throw one in the laundry, solves all the problems uh, that, that I just mentioned. Uh, and so Tide spends $100 million in marketing, and they hope to take a big chunk of the over billion dollar laundry industry. So they release Tide Pods. Tide Pods are doing OK, pretty well, actually. And then they hit a snag. Does anyone remember what the snag was? Yeah. I want to pause here for just a second. So some of you have no idea what I'm talking about are going, my, my colleague just said kids are eating them. There, there's no way kids are eating them, right? I mean, they're filled with chemicals, right? You're right. They are filled with chemicals. But yes, your colleague is right. People are eating them. Right, so there's a funny video online saying they looked good enough to eat. Someone showed a picture of them melted on top of a pizza. And suddenly, mostly young people were challenging one another to eat Tide Pods. It's called the Tide Pod Challenge. Right? Maybe you remember the Tide Pod Challenge from a few years back. Imagine being a Tide executive in this situation. Right? You're sitting there going, I mean, they're filled with chemicals. People should know not to eat them. Right? But just in case, they did what companies often do when they don't know what to do, which is they released a press release saying, don't eat Tide Pods. Right? And in case it wasn't enough, they did what companies also do when they don't know what to do, which is hire a celebrity. So they hired Rob Gronkowski, uh, Gronk as we know him, now of Tampa Bay Buccaneers fame, to shoot a public service announcement saying, don't eat Tide Pods. Right? Uh, and so they told people not to eat Tide Pods. Gronk told people not to eat Tide Pods. They thought that would be enough. Okay? Here's a little bit of data. This is searches for the Tide Pod Challenge over time. Okay? Uh, and, uh, uh, and they're pretty flat. And then they start going up around the Tide. And this is the moment where Tide releases their announcement. Now, Tide is hoping that the announcement will lead to a decreased interest in the Tide Pod Challenge. Worst case, it at least won't change interest in the Tide Pod Challenge. But as some of you can already guess, that's not what happened. Right? There was a fourfold increase in searches for the Tide Pod Challenge. And it wasn't just parents wondering what their kids are up to. Visits to poison control shoot up as well. In the next two weeks, more people come into poison control with Tide Pod related issues than had in the two years prior. Very simply, a warning became a recommendation. Telling people not to do something made them more likely to do it. Now, you're probably sitting there going, OK, great, but I'm not selling Tide Pods. And by the way, I'm trying to get people to do something, not not to do something. What does this have to do with me? This is just one example of a much broader phenomenon called reactants. When pushed, whether pushed to do something or pushed not to do something, People often push back. They often do the exact opposite uh, of what we want them to do. And so I want to spend a couple minutes talking about reactants, the science behind it, and then how to reduce it. And by the way, if this story doesn't sound exactly like what happened with masks and vaccines and all these other things, I don't know what does, right? We've seen all of these things in spades uh, in, in, in the last couple years. Uh, OK, so at the core, reactants is all about agency and control. People like to feel like they are in the driver's seat of their lives. 
why did I make the choice I made? Why did I buy the product I bought, use the service I, I use, uh, made the decision I made at the office? I did it because I wanted to. I am in the driver's seat of my life. But as soon as you, whether you are a colleague, whether you are a uh, marketer, whether you are a uh, salesperson, whatever it may be, as soon as you come in and try to push them or direct them one way or another, now if they're interested in doing that thing you wanted them to do, they're not sure if they're interested because they liked it or because you suggested that they do it. It's no longer clear who's in the driver's seat. And because of that, they push back. Right? Essentially, people have an ingrained anti-persuasion radar, almost like a spidey sense, uh, if you will, a uh, uh, sort of missile, anti-missile defense system that goes off when they feel like someone is trying to persuade them, and they push back. They avoid or ignore the message. Think what happens when a telemarketer calls you up, or you get an email in a, a sales sort of way that you weren't expecting, you delete it. Right? Or you leave the room when, a, when an ad comes on the television. Or even worse, right? the worst one of them is counter-arguing. Sure, we're in a meeting. Sure, people are shaking their head yes, like they agree with what they're, we're saying. But what are they really doing inside their heads? They're really sitting there going, no, nah, it's not going to work. That's going to be too expensive. That won't integrate with our existing systems. I don't like that thing. Right? Think about as a consumer when you hear an ad. Right? You hear an ad for a Ford truck, and Ford says, we're great on all these dimensions. You as a consumer don't sit there going, I believe you. Right? You as a consumer sit there going, well, of course, you, Ford, would say that. But how do I know it's actually true? Right? They poke and prod the arguments till it comes crumbling down. And so at the core, how do we reduce reactants? Right? How do we change people's minds when they're not going to listen to us? And so what we need to think about doing is allow for agency. We need to give people back some of that sense of freedom and control. And here I'll talk about three strategies to do it. There are more in the book, and I'm happy to talk more uh, in, the, in the question part uh, of the session. So one way to allow for agency is to do what I'll call providing a menu. This is super, super easy, right? One of the most basic strategies in the book. Uh, and so if you look, when, often when we present solutions or suggest directions, we suggest one option. So a consultant comes in and says, I think you guys should do this. Right? Or a project manager comes in and says, I think we should do this. Or a brand says, hey, consumer, I think you should do that. And as we talked about already, people are going to counter-argue. They're going to say, of course, you're going to say that, but here are all the reasons why I don't want to do it. And so what great catalysts, what great change agents often do, is rather than giving people one option, they give them multiple. They say, hey, I think you should do X or Y. Which do you think is better? And it's super simple, but notice what it subtly does. It shifts the role of the listener, right? Because over here, they're spending all their time thinking about why they don't like what you suggested. You've given them something, and they're pushing back on that thing. But over here, you've given them two options, and you've asked them a question, and now they have to think about which one they like better, which they are more than happy to do. But because they're focused on which one they like better, they're much more likely to pick one of those at the end of the interaction. Right? And so it's providing a menu, because think about what happens when you go to a restaurant. You don't go to a restaurant and they say, here's what you're having for dinner. Right? But you also don't go to a restaurant and they say, have whatever you want. You go to a restaurant and say, here's a limited set of options. Choose from within the choice set. It's guided choice. Right? It's strategically picking a real set of options. Right? If we give people fake options or decoy options, they're not going to go with what we want them to do. But give them two real options. Right? They'll be happy to choose among those two real options. Not 25 options, right? but a limited set of real options and encourage people to think about which one they like better, much more likely to make a choice that we wanted them to make in the first place and drive them uh, uh, to change. So that's one strategy. Uh, another building on that idea is called ask, don't tell. Uh, and so the idea here very simply is questions rather than statements. We make statements, people push back. And so instead, ask, ask questions. I was talking to a startup founder a couple years ago, and she was saying she was having a hard time motivating her team uh, to put in the extra hours on a project. They needed to stay late and on the weekend, and they didn't want to do it. Uh, and so she kept sort of pushing them to do it and telling them they needed to do it, and they didn't want to do it. So eventually, she calls a meeting, and she says, hey, what kind of company do we want to be? A good company or a great company? Now, that's not a real question. It's a rhetorical question, but we all know how we answer that question. How do we answer it? A great company, right? But then she asked a real, uh, real question. She said, how do we get there? How do we get there? Right? And questions do a couple things. First, just like the example I gave you of choice, it changes the job of the listener. She's now asked them for their opinion, which they are more than happy to provide. People love thinking about their opinion, right? And so now she's deactivated their attention to what they don't like and encouraged them to share their opinion, which they're happy to do. But also notice what she's doing. She's collecting information. Too often as change agents, we don't know what the barriers are. We don't know why someone hasn't changed. Right? Uh, I've often been talking to someone, either a client or even a friend, who didn't something didn't go their way. And I'll say, well, why didn't it happen? And they go, well, I don't know why they didn't do what I wanted them to do. Well, if we don't know, how are we going to fix it? And so questions allow us to collect information to better guide that journey. If we have a better sense of why someone does or doesn't want to change or what they're worried about, 
right? We can better shape uh, that process. But the third thing questions do is they encourage commitment to the conclusion. And what do I mean by that? So if she says, hey, what, what kind of things should we do to become a great company? And somebody says, hey, this is what I think we should do. And she later on says, great, we're going to do that. It's a lot harder for that person not to be on board because it was their idea in the first place. Right? And so once they've suggested something, they've essentially put a stick in the ground when later on you suggest that they're going to go along with it because it was their idea. I was presenting these, uh, these ideas a couple weeks ago, and someone said, you know, it's so funny. My boss loves feeling like things are their idea. I said, interesting. I don't think that's just your boss. right? Everyone likes feeling like things are their idea. The more you've participated in the process, the more ownership you have over the ideas or the process, the more bought in you are in the outcome. And so the question here is kind of how can we give some of that away? How can we ask questions uh, and allow that to give away some of the participation ownership so people will be more likely uh, to, be, to be on board? Let me give you one last example uh, uh, of ways to reduce reactants, and then I'll move on uh, to another idea in the framework. Uh, and this one's called Highlighting a Gap, and I'm going to show you a video here. And it's a video from uh, an anti-smoking campaign in Thailand. I know it's a bit unusual, but you'll see why in a second. So there's a group called the Thai Health Promotion Foundation. They want to get people to quit smoking. Let me tell you, smokers are not very interested in, in quitting smoking. And so I want you to check out the campaign that they ran, um, take a look at what they did, um, uh, and then we'll talk about it for a couple minutes. And I want us to focus less on what they did and more about why it worked. Okay, so uh, here's the campaign. I think I'm going to click uh, go and it'll play. Uh, take a look at it and let's talk then about why it worked. <laughs> Neat video, right? Uh, as they mentioned, hugely successful. 40% uh, increase in calls to the quit line. I know it went by pretty quickly, but 40% increase in calls to the quit line is, is amazing. Uh, videos of the campaign go viral on the web, uh, millions of views. Uh, but more interesting, I think, is why this was so effective. Why did this work? Any ideas? Why was this campaign so successful in changing behavior? Yeah. Yeah, so building on that, I would say the kids didn't tell them what to do. The kids encouraged them to realize it themselves, right? When, when I think about this idea of allowing for agency, I think about rather than persuading people, try to get them to persuade themselves, right? Rather than trying to sell people, get them to buy in. And so the Thai Health Promotion Foundation realized that if they push smokers, smokers are going to push back, right? If they told smokers what to do, smokers are going to say no. And so the main idea behind the campaign was how can we get smokers to convince themselves? Right? Uh, and so what they did is play on a very old uh, idea in psychology. People like their attitudes and their actions to line up. Right? If I say I care about the environment, I better recycle. If I, care, I say I love the 76ers, I better watch their games. Um, I want those two things to line up. And if they don't, uh, cognitive dissonance occurs. I feel bad, and so I do work to resolve that dissonance. And so here they've got a choice. Right? I've just told this kid not to smoke, and they've reminded me I'm smoking. And so I can either tell the kid that smoking is fine, which I'm not going to do, or stop smoking myself, which is what 40% of them did. 
right? What this campaign did is it highlighted a gap. It pointed out a gap between attitudes and actions. We often do things that don't line up. Our attitudes and actions often don't line up, but we don't realize it, right? The smokers would always tell kids not to smoke. They had just never been asked, right? But by asking, the kid said, wait a second. Hey, remember you're doing this thing that you're not telling me to do? That doesn't add up. And again, the kid said, don't. They didn't say stop smoking. The kid said, but do you want to do something about it, right? And we can think about the same thing with masks and vaccines and all those sort of things as well, right? Rather than saying, hey, wear a mask, Imagine you ask people, OK, hey, would you, if your kids were around or your elderly grandparents were around, would you want other people to wear a mask? If you'd say yes, well, maybe you should wear one as well. Right? Rather than telling them what to do, highlighting that gap between attitudes and actions and encouraging them to resolve it uh, uh, them themselves. And we can think about this in a variety of different domains. Right? Think about at the office. You got an old project, old initiative. It's not working. Right? An old way of doing things. You want to do a digital transformation, but somebody else doesn't want to. You want to do one thing, but they're stuck on an old thing that's losing money. If you tell them to kill the project, they're going to say no, because it's theirs. They have that status quo bias. Right? So take just a, a page out of what happened right here. Imagine if you said, hey, look, uh, there's a colleague, actually, within a different part of the organization. Or I have a friend at another company. And they're wondering, should they start something similar? You know, would you be willing to talk to them and share your thoughts? You know, would you recommend that they do something similar? And your colleague might say, no, I wouldn't recommend that they do something similar. Given what we know now, definitely not. But then you can say, OK, well, then why are we still doing it? Because if you wouldn't recommend it for someone else, why are we doing it? Right? There's an old, I think it's HP. There was some old uh, sort of leadership of HP that were trying to figure out whether to continue doing something, a certain line of the business. And they said to themselves, well, if we hired a new CEO, what would the new CEO do? Would the new CEO keep this line of business? If the new CEO would kill it, why am I waiting for the new CEO to come in to kill it? Why don't I just kill it? Right? Why do I need someone else who doesn't have that status quo bias to do it? And so highlighting a gap, either within one's own head or within others' heads, can, can help them make a, a change. I'm not going to talk about endowment today. That's the E in the framework. I'm going to skip distance. Also, I want to spend a couple minutes on, on uncertainty, because I think it's a, a great one with some useful strategies. Uh, and then I'll wrap up and take, uh, take some questions. Uh, and so uh, at the core, any time there's change, uh, there are what are called switching costs. Can somebody think about an example of a switching cost? Uh, if, you, if you know sort of what switching costs are, the, the switching costs of a change that you might uh, have in your, your life or a change that someone else might have in their life. What is a cost uh, of switching from something old to something new? Time. Somebody pick uh, time. What, what's an example of time cost? Learning the new thing. Right? So hey, there's a new uh, platform, new software at the office. Uh, I have to figure out how to use it. I've got to get a login, which I've got to remember. I've got to figure out where everything is. This happens to me. I just uh, got the new operating system on my phone, which was a terrible idea, by the way. If you haven't gotten iOS 15, stay out of it. And like every time I want to open up a web page, I have to remember how to do it because it's different than before. It takes more effort. That's a cost of change. What's another cost of change? Status. What do you mean by status? Um, failure, where like, you're the expert, and then suddenly you try something different. Got it, right? And so it's safe sticking with the old thing, but it's risky doing the new thing. We think about monetary cost of change. What's an example of a monetary cost of change? Changing cameras. Changing cameras. You have an old one. It's free. You already bought it. Right? You're going to spend the money to buy a new one. It's going to cost money to do it. And so whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's effort, whether it's status, there are lots of costs of doing something new. All those costs are basically gone with the, the status quo. You're, you're sticking with what you're doing already. You don't have to pay those costs. But new things have costs. Not surprisingly, people want benefits rather than costs. So the costs make them not want to do anything new. But let me tell you, it gets worse. Think about for any of these changes we've talked about, when the costs of change happen and when the benefits of change happen. Right? So the cost uh, of downloading that new uh, iOS update and the benefits. Uh, the cost of a new camera and the benefits of a new camera. The cost of a new car and the benefits of a new car. What's first, the cost or the benefits? Costs. And also think about which is more certain. Is the cost more certain or the benefit more certain? Costs are more certain. This is called the cost-benefit timing gap. Not only are you asking people to incur costs, but the costs are now. And the benefits, if they ever happen, are later. You're asking people to give up a pretty good thing. It's not perfect, but a pretty good thing for something that might be better, but they don't know if it's better or not. And they've got to incur all these costs to get there. No wonder nobody wants to change. Right? So we sit there saying, oh, it's going to be better. But they say, how do I know it's going to be better? And there's all these costs to get there. How do we close that cost-benefit timing gap? Let me give you one more example. This is a study that was done at Stanford probably now 30 years ago. Um, uh, great, great old study. So they tell students it's the end of the semester. 
Uh, you just took a tough exam, you feel tired and run down, but congratulations, you passed. You have the opportunity to buy a very attractive five-day Hawaii vacation package, but it expires tomorrow, the offer at this low price. Do you want to buy the package, not buy the package, or decide later? Okay, everyone get the situation? Pretty simple. Most students say, well, look, I passed an exam. I want to celebrate. I'll go buy the vacation package. That makes a lot of sense. Second group of students gets a very similar scenario with one detail different. You failed the exam. Same exam, same feeling tired and run down, uh, same Hawaii vacation package at a low price, same options of buying, not buying, or decide later. Now, these students aren't happy. They're bummed, right? But they say, look, I can't take the exam till next semester anyway. I've got to study somewhere. I might as well study in Hawaii, sort of lick my wounds. I'll buy the vacation package. OK, so you pass, you buy the vacation package. You fail, you buy the vacation package. I think some of you can guess where this is going, but there's actually a third group. All that's different in the third group is you don't know yet. There's uncertainty. You'll find out tomorrow whether you passed or you failed. Do you want to buy that vacation package, not buy it, or decide later? And what I love about this example is for folks who like economics or folks who like decision trees, sort of decision theory, it's clear what people should do. Not what do people actually do, but what should people do here? Buy the vacation package, right? Walk down that decision tree. You don't know yet. You're at a node in the decision tree. But if it ends up, there are two options, passing or failing. If you pass, you buy it. And you fail, you buy it. So you can work back up the decision tree. You should buy it. Right? What do you think people actually do? Decide later. Right? They hit the pause button. Anytime we don't know what to do, we do nothing. Because right? it's easier to do nothing. We hope that that uncertainty will resolve if it ever does. And so the challenge of change, right? pause button's great for the status quo. Because people keep doing whatever they're doing. But it's challenging for innovation and change because they're going to stick with what they're doing already. How do we get people to unpause? Right? How do we ease that uncertainty and get people to take action? And so I'll show you a couple uh, examples of how to, how to do this. Um, one comes from a company we all know called Dropbox. Right? Today we think about Dropbox as a very successful billion dollar unicorn business, but they weren't that way at the beginning. When they started, they had a lot of trouble getting customers. Why? Because people were used to storing things on their desktop. They didn't know what the cloud was. They didn't want to use this new service that they were uncertain whether it was going to work or not. Sure, Dropbox said they were great, but how does the customer actually know? And so the safest thing was to continue doing what they were doing. Dropbox thought about investing a lot of money in ads. They thought about investing a lot of money um, uh, in SEO and other sorts of things. They ended up doing something really clever. They gave Dropbox away for free. They said, anyone who wants to try out Dropbox can get two gigabytes of storage absolutely free. Right? Now, you might be sitting there going, well, how do you build a billion dollar business giving away something for free? Well, they didn't just give away something for free. They harnessed something called freemium. And many of you may be familiar with the idea of, of freemium. Uh, it is a portmanteau, or a combination of two words, free and premium. Yes, there's a free version of Dropbox, but there's also a premium version of Dropbox. You use it, you like it, you get those two gigabytes of storage for free, you may want to upgrade to pay for the premium version. Now, it's clear why consumers love free. Right? Why wouldn't I love free? I, it, I'm not having to pay anything. But companies like it as well. Right? Companies love it. There are dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands, of billion dollar businesses built on freemium. Right? Dropbox uses freemium. LinkedIn uses freemium. Zoom uses freemium. New York Times uses freemium. Uh, Evernote uses freemium. Pandora uses freemium. Basically, every software as a service we are aware of uses some sort of freemium business model. And the reason they like it so much is because it solves a key problem. Right? If your product or service is great, you can tell the customer that, but they're not going to believe you. Why? Because someone whose product wasn't so great would say the same thing. And so it's not very diagnostic, what we say through paid media or owned media. But it was diagnostic as personal experience. Right? If this thing is great, let me give it away for free and allow you to experience it. Because if you like it so much, you've convinced yourself that it's good, and so you'll be willing to upgrade to the premium version. And so I love freemium. I think it's amazing. I recommend every client I work with apply some version of freemium. Uh, but I often work with clients that say, well, wait a second. I get how you do this if you sell software as a service, because your costs are really low. It doesn't cost Dropbox very much to give away some storage. It costs the New York Times nothing to give away that one article to an additional person. But what if I sell physical goods? Uh, what if I'm a fleet management company? What if I'm a, a hospital or a doctor? How do I harness freemium? But if you think about it, freemium is actually just one example of a much bigger and broader idea. So think about uh, a new car. You want a new car, right? So you say, look, I'm interested in this new car. Uh, if a dealer said, that's fantastic, you're interested in this new car, pay me $40,000, and I'll let you check it out. Would you ever buy a new car? No. What do you want first? You want some experience. And so what does the dealer do? They give you a test drive. 
Test drives, whether in car dealerships or in technologies, are exactly the same as freemium. There's no free version of the product and premium version of the product, but it does the same thing, which is lower the barrier to trial. Right? It gives people experience without having to pay all those costs. It solves the cost-benefit timing gap. Right? It takes some of those costs and it kicks them down the road to later, whether freemium or not. Right? And it's not just test drives. Free shipping does the same thing. People hate paying for, for shipping. Why? Because they want the good. Right? And they don't want to have to pay to figure out whether they're going to like it or not. So free shipping has enabled e-commerce, free shipping and returns. Right? Um, I talked to the Zappos co-founders in the book about the story of free shipping. Amazing story. Has solved a lot of the problem. Right? Has turned Zappos. They didn't want to have showrooms. They've made your living room their showroom. Right? And free shipping has enabled it. Same with free samples uh, at the grocery store. Same with renting rather than buying. These things aren't freemium, but they serve the same purpose. They lower the barrier to trial. They take all those upfront costs that you'd usually have to pay to, before you get to experience and remove at least some of them, making it easier to try. And the same thing works internally. So uh, Zappos actually another great story, both externally with free shipping, but also internally. When they were starting, they had a lot of trouble getting off the ground. Right? They had some money uh, from venture capitalists. In fact, the only good news that venture capitalists said was there's such a bad business to be in that there's no competition. Right? And today, it's obvious that people like shopping online. Right? Some of you may be shopping online while I'm talking. Uh, hopefully not, but some of you may be. But you've probably been online shopping this week. But in the early 2000s, that wasn't what the market looked like. We forget, but in the early 2000s, it was really unlikely that people were going to shop online. Very few people were doing it. They were uncertain about what they were going to get. They didn't trust the merchants. And so Zappos had this problem. They said, well, look, we've got a little money, and we want to figure out whether people will buy shoes online. But think about how much it would cost to set up a warehouse with all the inventory, build a perfect website, and do all those things. They would burn through all their venture money so that if they didn't actually, consumers didn't want to buy shoes online, they were out of business. And so they wanted to figure out a way to de-risk the process to make it easier to gain some learnings without so much cost. And so what did they do? Well, they did something really, really clever. They went to local running shoe stores and said, hey, let me take a picture of your inventory. And I'm going to put a picture of your inventory on my website. And if someone buys your shoes from me, I'll buy them from you and ship it to the person. And running shoe stores said, well, that's fantastic. I don't know what a website is, but it sounds cool. You're going to sell some of my inventory. Great. But there's one question. You're selling the customer my shoes at $100, and you're buying them from me for $100, and you're paying shipping. Aren't you going to go out of business? Aren't you going to lose money? And indeed, Zappos lost money. After, of every pair of shoes they sold, they lost money, $5, $10, $15. $10. But it was still an amazing strategy. And if you think about why, there are two reasons. First, they only lost money if consumers would buy shoes online which is the thing they wanted to test and learn about. If nobody buys shoes online, they didn't lose any money. So it's perfect. The incentives are perfectly lined up. And right, they lost a lot less money, even if 1,000 people end up buying shoes online, a lot less money than they would have buying all that inventory and doing that work up front. Same idea, lowering the barrier to trial, even internally with things you want to test and learn from. How can you make it easier to get some of the benefit or some of the experience before you pay uh, all the cost? One last example, uh, and then I will wrap up. Uh, and this is with test drives again. Right? So there's a challenge with test drives. I love the idea of test drives in whatever business we're in. But there's a problem. Who takes a test drive? If you're Acura, who comes and takes a test drive? You have to know Acura exists as a brand. And you have to what? Kind of think you'd like it. Right? If you don't think you'd like Acura, Acura's not for you, you're never going to go get a test drive. And so you're only appealing to a small set of the market. How can you get those larger set of the market that might love what you're doing if they took a test drive but wouldn't come in to get one. How can you get them to find out about what you're doing right, and be interested in it? And so Acura had this problem a few years ago. People who knew the brand loved it. People had one Acura, came back and bought another Acura. But there weren't enough people like that. right? They had been in the market longer than Lexus. Lexus was kicking their tail. They had to do something to get, uh, get attention. So they did something really interesting. They paired with W Hotels, high-end hotel. And then when you checked into a W, you'd get a little slip of paper that said, hey, staying at a W, you can get a ride anywhere in town for free in an Acura. You don't have to be in the car market. You don't have to be interested in a new car. You just need a ride to the airport, your meeting, anything at all. Now, did everyone who stayed at the hotel take a ride in Acura? No, but hundreds of thousands of them did. Did they all end up buying an Acura? No, but tens of thousands of them did. Because this program drove discovery. It brought the trial to people. Rather than a test drive where they have to go to the dealership and know they're interested, how can we embed an experience, a test of an experience of what we want other people to do in something they're already doing? Right? They don't have to step out of their everyday lives to get it. They learn from that experience within their, what they're already doing, and then they decide it's valuable, and then they're more likely to do it. Right? More likely to try uh, means more likely to, to buy. 
Let me just wrap up, and then I think I have time for questions. Yes, who's ever got the time? Fantastic. So as we talked about today, catalysts reduce roadblocks. What do we mean by that? Well, uh, they reduce a number of different roadblocks, right? They reduce reactants. They give people choice. They allow for agency. They encourage participation. Rather than pushing people, which leads to pushing back, they involve people uh, in, in the process. They ease endowment. Right? That's all about the status quo bias. We tend to be attached to the old thing. We tend to think the old thing is safe. How can we ease that endowment? How can we highlight the cost of inaction, making people realize that doing nothing isn't as safe uh, as it might seem? Right? If the status quo was terrible, people would have already changed. Because right? it was terrible, they'd do something new. The problem is it's not bad enough. They're sitting there going, it's not bad enough. It's, it might not be worth changing. There's a great study that kind of looks at this in, um, in medicine. We say, hey, which do you think is worse, a minor injury or a major one? Which causes you more pain, a minor injury or a major, a major injury? And we'd all say, well, major injury, of course, right? If I had a heart attack or shattered my knee or busted my elbow, it would cause a lot of pain. And that intuition makes a lot of sense, right? It is very painful to go through those experiences, but a minor injury actually causes more pain. Any idea why? You don't get it fixed, right? Exactly. And so if things are terrible, we do the work. We get them fixed. Right? If you have a house that's infested with cockroaches, you call an exterminator. But if you have a couple of flies every once in a while, you never call the exterminator, and you deal with a couple of flies the rest of your life. You deal with those minor injuries the entire time. right? And so often, we are right below that threshold. What they're doing is not perfect, but it's also not terrible, and so it's not enough to get them to change. We need to highlight the cost of inaction and showing them that doing nothing, living with a minor injury, or having a couple of flies in your house all the time is actually not ideal and encourage them to take, uh, to take the action. Distance too far from people's backyard, they tend to disregard information. Right? If what we're asking is too far away from where they are currently, they're not even going to consider the possibility of change. And so what we need to do is chunk the change. Take big change, break it down into smaller chunks, ask for less, and only then uh, ask for more. Uncertainty we talked about, right? uh, easing that risk that people feel uh, through lowering the barrier to trial, and there are a number of ways to do that. And corroborating evidence is just multiple sources of proof. Right, if we're trying to change something small, like a pebble, you put a pebble on a scale, it only takes a little bit of weight to make the pebble go. But if we're trying to move something big, challenging, risky, important, expensive, like a boulder, right, if we think about a, a boulder, you've got to put a lot of weight on that scale. There's got to be a lot of proof to get someone to change something that they're really ingrained in. And so often multiple sources of proof are required. Not just one, but multiple different sources providing different perspectives in a short enough period of time uh, to, to drive action. Uh, two key next steps uh, from this talk. I got two last slides. Um, uh, I love events like this. I often come back to the office with pages and pages of notes, but then my question is always, what do I do first? Right, so I would say two things to walk away from this talk uh, with. The first, let's be better at finding the parking brakes. Right? You may be sitting there going, I like your five brakes, but I think in my line of work there's a sixth one or a seventh one. That's fine. We tend to have barrier blindness. We tend to be unaware of what the barriers are. Right? Uh, it's really hard to create change if we're blind to the barriers. And so let's start to recognize what those barriers are. Let's find the parking brakes uh, and let's, uh, let's identify them. You know, when you go to a doctor's office, a doctor doesn't say, hey, let me put a cast on your leg. A doctor starts by diagnosing the problem. Well, tell me what's wrong, then I'll figure out the solution. Too often we jump to the solution because we know the outcome we want to achieve. We need to back up a couple steps, understand the person we're trying to change uh, a bit better. And then second, once we've found the parking brakes, we can figure out how to mitigate them. Uh, and in case it's helpful, there's an application guide on my website, uh, just myname.com slash resources, that you can download uh, and work on with your teams. Uh, there's a guide for changing a boss's mind or a colleague's mind, changing your organization. There's an external facing guide for customers uh, and clients and consumer behavior, one pagers, uh, and things along those lines. Because good news, it's not random, it's not luck, and it's not chance. There's a science behind why people change and why they don't. If we understand that science, we can um, do more effective messaging uh, and build better experiences. We can become more effective change agents. And at the core, uh, we can change anything. Uh, so thank you guys so much. Hope you enjoyed uh, the talk. And I'd love to answer some questions. Thank you. Yes? I have two quick questions. One, Please. Um, did any of the smokers like the kids' cigarette? Yeah. Uh, why are you asking? I'm just curious if that happened. I don't, so I, I'm not, I am not the Thai Health Promotion Foundation. I did not work with them. Uh, I am not aware. Uh, I think they said at the end that um, uh, they all threw away their cigarettes. I don't think any of them told the kid to smoke. But, but what I love, by the way, about that campaign is no one knows more about the dangerous smokers, uh, smoking than smokers, right? They have all the information. We tend to think, oh, if I just give people a little more information, information's the problem. But they are like doctors, right? Emphysema, lung cancer, strokes. Like, they know it all, and they're still doing it. And so giving them more information is not going to solve it. Yeah, sorry, you said something else. So um, you spoke to both 
convincing consumers and uh, your employees. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point, you know, you want to inspire your employees, you want to convince them, but there's also that element of, hey, just do what I'm telling you. So yes. How does that weigh into this? Yeah. You know, I think it's fortunate to be in the position of being able to tell people what to do. Um, uh, if we can just legislate things, whether as governmental organizations or as bosses, uh, and people will do them, that's great. I think the challenge of that, though, is even when we can legislate something, I know as bosses we don't legislate something, but we basically do, um, it's not going to be as effective as we have buy-in. Right? If people aren't interested in doing it, if people don't want to do it, they're going to drag their feet, they're not going to do as good of a job. Um, and so even in cases where we can tell people what, what to do, I think the more we can make them feel bought into the process, the more we can make them feel like it's kind of their idea, the more choice we can give them, the better off we're going we're to be. I mean, I haven't heard of an organization, they, were, uh, you know, they merged with another company, um, and they were giving people new roles. They were either get, getting rid of people or giving them new roles. And they could have just said, hey, here's your role. Right? And people would have said, thanks, I guess, because right? I like having a paycheck, so I'll keep working here. But instead, what they did is said, hey, we think these two or three roles will be good for you. Which one do you want? And that's a very small thing, but it, one, allows people to select in what they think they're going to be better at, and two, gives them more satisfaction. I got to choose this. I'm at least a bit happier, and so I'm going to be happier when I'm coming into work, and I'm probably going to do a better job. Yeah. Yes? So also two questions with this. So first of all, how do you get people from thinking a nice to have to a need to have? Well, how do you get that? Yes. And how do you link that with your um, to support and belief and love the freemium model? Yes. Yeah, so let me answer the first question, and then I want to make sure I understand the second one. So I actually talk a lot about in the book about vitamins and painkillers, which is basically what, what you just said. So um, people in startup land talk about vitamins and painkillers. A vitamin is a nice to have, a painkiller is a need to have. Right? Uh, oh, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd love to take a vitamin, and I know I should take vitamins, and thank you for telling me again why vitamins are a good idea, and I will definitely get to it one day. It's a nice to have, right? Whereas painkillers are a need to have. Like, if I, if I have a headache, I'm, I'm not wondering whether I should or not should. I'm, tell me where the Tylenol is, I'm going to get it. And so in the distance chapter, uh, one of the ideas of the distance chapter is any decision, any person can be right on a football field of beliefs. Easy to see with politics right and left, but anything at all, someone can be near or far to where you want them to go. Um, uh, and we always want to start with the people for which our product or service or idea is that need to have, right? Start with the folks who if we just told them it existed, if I just tell you what aisle the Tylenol is, you will go buy it, right? I tell my students the same thing. I was talking to someone today who was interested in, in a startup, and, I, and she was like, well, how do I think about go-to-market strategy? And I said, well, don't start doing 17 things at once for different people. Start by figuring out the set of people for whom if they just knew you existed, Right? They'd be, you don't have to do any persuasion. Think about that customer journey. No persuasion. All you need is awareness. You tell me you exist, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. And so I, I often would say, let's start with those folks um, that are closer on that football field, the folks for which our solution, our product, our service, our thing is that need to have, that painkiller, and then use them to help us with other folks. Right? Use them and use the power of word of mouth. This book is all about word of mouth and how to get it. Um, I think word of mouth is fantastic. I think it's the second best thing. Only uh, the first best would be personal experience. Um, that's why I like freemium so much. Um, uh, and so that's what I would say for the first thing, is, is uh, figure out those folks for which we are uh, uh, a need to have. The other question, I'm not sure I understood. The question really relates to it, which is can freemium or you know, trying it out and using it take you from it? Oh, I thought this was nice to, oh my god, I'm addicted to it. Like, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. We're actually just talking about this in class, what is today, Friday? Wednesday. Yeah, so I'm teaching the core at the moment. So it's like the introduction to uh, marketing for all our, our MBA students. And Wednesday was pricing day, and we are talking about freemium quite a bit. Um, uh, and one thing I was saying is if you look at successful freemium, there's an appendix, by the way, in the back of the book all about how to do freemium uh, a bit better. But if you, uh, the catalyst, the yellow one. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but one thing we talk a lot about is sort of uh, you build these experiences, right? But you also want to create lock-in in some, in some way, right? Because if you have freemium, but there's no lock-in at all, so think about what's happening like um, the, uh, what, what would you call Blue Apron? Like the food sort of uh, at home, yeah, subscription services, right? They uh, looked like they were going to do well and then tanked, in part because there's no stickiness there. There's no reason to stay with one of them. You use Blue Apron. And you great, you enjoyed the six free meals or whatever it is, and then you go to HelloFresh, and then you go to Yellow Apron or Green Apron or whatever the next one is, and there's no reason to stay, right? It's freemium, it's a free trial, it's a version of freemium, version of low, but they haven't thought about their retention strategy. Whereas if you think about something like Pandora, 
let's say. So Pandora is the same thing, right? Uh, free trial. Uh, you can use it as long as you want, I believe, but you get ads. Um, why don't people just switch to another platform? Let's say they had a free 30 days or whatever it is. Why don't people just switch to another platform? Or Dropbox, same thing, right? When, drop, when people hit the two gigabyte storage, why don't they just switch to another platform? The switching costs, right? But notice who's created those switching costs. It's not the brand saying you have to stick with us or else we're gonna punish you, like frequent flyer miles do. It's the consumers creating their own switching costs because the consumers have customized that experience for themselves on Pandora or on Dropbox, they've loaded all the stuff themselves. Now it's more work for them to do the switching and so they've created the switching costs and they can't blame you as the brand. Right? They're happy to pay you, and they've created stickiness because they put themselves into it. And so whether we're Blue Apron, HelloFresh, or a bunch of other things in this space, I think thinking about that retention, how we build in stickiness through encouraging consumers or customers to create their own switching costs is going to be a lot more effective than penalizing people or, or other things. I love freemium. Everyone should do some version of freemium or lowering the barrier to trial. What I love about it is it only works if what we're offering is good. Right? If, what, if people try it and they don't like it, it's not going to work. And so it causes us to solve the problem for our customers, which I think is our, our big goal anyway. Maybe one, I don't know where we are on time, one or two more if there are. One or two more. Can some of these things be used for enterprise sales to uh, Bigger product, which is like, let's say, enterprise software. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would ask why couldn't they be? they be used for enterprise software. So, you know, I, I work with a lot of clients in B2B as well as in sort of enterprise software spaces. And I think about the same sort of things, right? I mean, we have to think about who that customer is, right? And it's obviously m multiple people. But I think a lot about how can I give away some sort of experience that allows people to get a sense of what we're, we're doing um, without uh, having to pay all those upfront costs. And so to me, um, how we do it may be a little bit different, but the principles behind it are exactly the same. Whether we can do. Uh, there would be a separate influencer, separate decision maker, and multiple people can be influencers, I think, right? And each one may really have a different priority based on their reputation. Good, yeah. But what I would think about, right, is then we have multiple customers. Right? And I would think about sketching out that customer journey for those multiple customers. And I would try to think about what they need to make that decision and how I can move them down the journey and use experience to do that. And so you're very right. What, what works for the user may be different than what works for the payer. Um, and maybe I want to use the user to encourage them to put pressure on the, on the payer. It depends on the type of situation we're talking about. But to me, it's conceptually the same, right? We may want to have a different experience that we're offering, uh, but the ideas are the same, whether it's giving people choice, whether it's lowering the barrier to trial, the concepts are the same, uh, even if we may apply them a little bit differently. My second question would be in terms of sales, right? Yep. So this fundamentally can, or should ideally have an impact in terms of changing as to how sales training is done? Yes. Because sales training a lot is in terms of push. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. I do a bit of work with sales teams on training them how to think about these things. I mean, what I will say is it's not that no one's thought about these things, right? I've talked to salespeople who've said, and I've talked to consultants who said, what'd you say? This is sales 101. Yeah. I think it is for some places. Yes, good, yes, I, I would agree. So, you know, I did um, uh, a podcast a couple months ago with the folks that do a challenger sale, um, and they talk about training folks on exactly this. And so I'm not saying all the ideas here no one's ever thought of before, um, but I think it's the right way to do things, uh, and it's not the training that everyone, uh, everyone gets. And so I think, uh, you know, I talk a lot in the introduction of the book and the reactants chapter about hostage negotiators and how they start not by influence, they start by understanding the person they're trying to change, right? And use that understanding of the person then to craft a process that leads to the outcome. I think the same thing can be said of, of good sales folks, right? They understand they're not just about building relationships, but they're understanding the people they're serving enough to be able to guide that journey um, and create value for both sides. I mean, I'm teaching the marketing course. We talk a lot about not only capturing a value, but creation of value. And I think that's when sales is well, goes well. It's not about telling people to buy something they don't need. It's helping them find the right thing um, through understanding what they need. But we've got to start with understanding. Well, thank you, guys. I will hang out for a couple more minutes if there are any questions. And otherwise, thanks so much and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.